Hello, and welcome to this live stream production from Cafe Lena, the historic listening room in Saratoga Springs, New York. Today's free stream is made possible by the generous support of the Sarah B. Folk Charitable Fund, as well as by the Adirondack Trust Company Community Fund, Kevin and Claudia Bright, Polly Set, and our virtuoso and lifetime members. You can watch past episodes of this series on youtube.com slash Cafe Lena. To learn more about our nonprofit venue and programs, please visit cafelena.org. Enjoy your front row seats for this event, live from Cafe Lena. It's just how I put you at ease, Steve. Yes, sir. Well, it's okay. all friendly faces. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming out to Art of Community. This is a monthly series that we do um, that celebrates nonprofits in Saratoga, gets us all in the same room, and uh, enables us to learn a little bit more about each other's work and the people behind the organizations, our stories, and what we know about running nonprofits. And, um, just helps us to share our skills and information, and it's it's been a really neat thing that's been going on for a little less than a year. And it is sponsored in part by the Adirondack Trust Community Fund, and it's also uh, receives a lot of organizing support from the Saratoga County Chamber of Commerce. So we thank both of those partners in making this possible. They both believe very strongly in the value of nonprofit organizations in this community, and there is a huge diversity of them. Um, one thing I like to do when we start is to just quickly go around the room and find out which organizations are represented here. And um, I'm gonna repeat what you say into the mic, not just because I have echolalia, but because um, I just want to get it on camera and it won't be able to hear what you say. Hi, I'm Spencer. I'm the new grants coordinator at Saratoga Arts. Saratoga Arts, great. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm a subcontractor at Hudson Headwaters Health Network. Hudson Headwaters Health Network. Uh, I'm Pam Abrams. I'm on the board at Cafe Lena. And I met Steve recently at uh, an opera performance. I'm happy to be here. Great. Cafe Lena board member. <laughs> Holy smokes. This was a very long list that starts with Saratoga Pride, and it just goes from there. And it includes Planned Parenthood, and it's an amazing list. Thank you for being here. Ellen. Great, the book festival and the library. Jen and I am also with the Friends of the Saratoga Springs Public Library. Great, Friends of the Library. Oh. <laughs> Liz, you go first, ladies first. <laughs> County Chamber, yep. Cafe Lena, great. UHY rocks, thank you. <laughs> great. Eric Rudy, homemade theater. Homemade theater and pride, great. And Beth, Cafe Lena staff member. <laughs> great, MLK Saratoga. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, I'm Sarah Craig. I'm the executive director of Cafe Lena. And I'm here this afternoon with Steve Rosenblum, uh, who is representing also uh, a lot of organizations. It's Opera Saratoga. It's Saratoga Pride. And it's Saratoga Book Festival. And immediately upon hearing those three names, one common factor pops out at me, and that is the word Saratoga. <laughs> um, and so I was just wondering, is this your hometown, or uh, what brought you here? So I moved to Saratoga from Boston in 2014 for a job um, mm -hmm. to work at the Maisie Center to be an event planner for their learning conferences, which was a conference for about 2,000 learning professionals in Orlando every year that I ran for seven years, I think. Wow. And when 2020 hit with all of that um, COVID and 
I conferences went it. bust and I retired. <laughs> so, so then now since I've been retired, I've been doing mostly volunteer things for all these organizations. Wow. And, um, and yeah, Saratoga is important to me. And, you know, one of the things that really has made it such a great place to live for me is that it's so easy to make a difference here that you really can get involved in things at a very leadership kind of a level and really make things happen and make a difference, which although I did stuff in Boston for years, you know, you don't really feel the same impact that you can here. Yeah, it's kind of neat. I've always felt here that it's the, um, it's like big enough to feel like you're making a difference in the world and like making some noise. And it's small enough, like you said, that you can really uh, get meaningfully involved very quickly. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so uh, the place where I often start these conversations is just um, drilling into like how you got on a path of community service in your life because you certainly are very focused on serving the community. So I was raised in a family where service was important. My dad was a public defender and um, my stepmom was a, a social worker working with um, people in poverty primarily. And, you know, my dad worked with all sorts of, you know, very difficult cases in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And, you know, I used to ask him, how do you do this work? How do you um, defend people who are, you know, rapists and murderers and drug dealers? And, and he said, you know, it, it's not about defending them or, or setting them free. It's about making sure they're treated fairly and that just because they're poor or homeless or not white, that they don't get the shaft. Mm -hmm. And um, that really resonated with me all my life. And so when you know, I was living in Boston, I started to get involved in, in a number of organizations. I actually went to school to be a special ed teacher. And, um, and when I left teaching, because I was kind of disillusioned and went into the corporate world, I still made sure I had a foot in volunteer opportunities with the Boston Public Schools and then uh, AIDS organizations and things like that. I think when people think about uh, nonprofits, they're often thinking more about that end of the spectrum and they're not necessarily thinking about opera or folk music or uh, you know, basically the performing arts. Um, how did you end up on the arts side of the nonprofit sector? Well, to be honest, I got burnt out with HIV and AIDS. I mean, that was um, so much of my life in the 90s and 80s was around AIDS activism, AIDS um, volunteering, and, you know, after so much, you know, loss, I needed to do something different. And I've always loved arts. I've always been, you know, very interested in theater. Um, my husband runs homemade theater. I mean, we, we just, it's a big part of what we're interested in and what we do. And, and I think it's really important to realize the impact the arts have on a, on a community. Um, not that, you know, all of the other human services organizations aren't incredibly important and I do what I can to support them as well. But, but you know, having a healthy and vibrant arts scene in a town, as you well know, is a sign of health. It's a, an indicator of, of how well a town is doing. And so to be involved in the opera and to be involved in um, the book festival are true indicators that this town is healthy and thriving and that people are able to focus on things that are other than basic needs, and that's really important. Pride is kind of a different story. I think, you know, the pride involvement is much more about the community and, and supporting the um, LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. And so it's still, I still primarily am focused on doing events with the pride community. That's kind of what I get mostly in, involved in because of my background, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's stuff that I think is important. That's great. The, the two reasons that I felt really interested in starting this conversation series was one, I feel like everybody needs to be heard. Um, I think that was a big takeaway for all of us uh, in the summer of 2020 when the when the Black Lives Matter protests really got going and George Floyd happened and you realized what a pressure cooker you create if people's stories aren't heard. And so when you do pride work, I see that as being part of making um, the story of the community visible. And then um, the other reason that I started this series was because of this idea of health. 
you know, I began to realize that, you know, not just Hudson Headwaters Health Network, uh, not, you know, just shelters of Saratoga or some of the more obvious contributions to health are happening, but like we're all trying to make a healthier community. And, um, and it's great to be able to talk about that. How do you think the arts make a healthier community? Well, I think it's an incredible outlet for people. I mean, I think about the stuff that homemade theater does and community theater and the creative outlet it provides for so many people, hundreds of people every year perform or do backstage work or usher even because it creates an outlet for them to, to be creative and to do something that fulfills that need that they have. And for others of us, it's going to see things. It's going to see the opera, and it's going to the book festival. And I mean, the book festival, because of the, the obvious title literacy and, and just the enjoyment that so many of us have, you know, how many people I talk to, and whenever I talk to anybody about the book festival, I suddenly learn what a reader they are, and how many books they love, and what kind of books they love. And people really enjoy getting into talking about that and, and sharing that kind of stuff. It really is amazing. It's amazing to see people come into an arts event, you know, rushing, finding their parking spot, getting done at the restaurant, whatever it is, and then just all of that just lifts off of them when they're in that creative space around a play that just puts them in another world or uh, in an, uh, sharing a musical experience at the tables together. And when they leave, they're just like, just shining and glowing. It's a really beautiful thing to watch. And, you know, I, um, I came here out of the peace movement and trying to get nuclear weapons eradicated from the face of the earth, and I wasn't being very successful with that. And, um, <laughs> and that also really burned me out. Like, it's hard when you're losing all the time, you know? And um, definitely in the 80s and 90s, it felt like we were losing all the time in the AIDS struggle, too. It was extremely painful. And I understand that burnout. And the arts is such a... a healing force in a moment like that and in a life like that and I think everybody's lives have you know places that need to be healed so yeah. and I think in the you know for the the work with the um, LGBTQ plus community I think that one for me is is about safety it's mm -hmm. about making people feel accepted and safe in their home and that's one thing that's wonderful about Saratoga I mean being June and Pride Month and seeing the flags on Broadway and and you know, knowing that there are kids who are growing up seeing that and seeing the Pride Festival, we had a thousand people Sunday for Pride, and so many families and kids. It was incredible, and you know, to to give them that space to be there and to be who they want to be and to yeah. see other people who are accepting and who are loving and all of that. Uh, to be able to give that is just, you know, we're so lucky that we can do that for kids. There was a Pride open mic here that you guys were involved in. I was in. here, yes. Yes, and um, I understand that a teenager came down and did his very first drag performance, and his mom was here with him. I cried. It yeah. was so moving. I mean, he was just incredible. And, yeah. and got up here and said, you know, this is my first time doing this. And his mom was sitting right there, and she was so supportive. Afterwards, I went over to her, and I just said, you know, you're incredible to be here and support your son like this. So, wonderful. I think those moments really, really matter. And, um, and how gratifying to know that you, as an organizer behind the scenes, played such an important uh, role in making that moment happen. Gosh, am I ever caught up in this and I'm completely lost in <laughs> what questions I was gonna ask. Um, okay, let me, let me just sort of like, stop being emotional and think about just kind of like the nonprofit part of it. So you are the president of the board of Opera Saratoga. Um, I imagine you've probably served on boards before and you've had different roles in nonprofits. How is it different being the president of the board? I have been on a bunch of nonprofit boards and um, I've never been a president of a board before. I've been treasurer, I've been secretary, I've been a number of different roles, but this is the first time really being the leader of the board, and it is different. Um, I didn't know that it would be so different. I mean, I, I knew that I'd have more to do, and I, I stopped working because I knew that I would need to spend more time focusing on, on, the, on the opera, but what I didn't oh God, realize what was... what a lucky organization. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> so, but what I didn't realize was the 
sort of feeling of accountability and mm. visibility. You know, I'm behind the scenes. I like to be behind the scenes. That's been my sort of MO for most of my life is, you know, even when I did theater, I was on the stage crew. I, I really prefer to be behind the scenes. This is a stretch for yeah, me. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, with the role of president, there isn't a choice. I feel like I need to be out there. I needed to be doing our annual meeting, which, you know, we had a bunch of people and it was on Zoom doing our gala and being in front of everybody at the gala. Those are all things that sort of push my, my limits a little bit. But it's a supportive board. It's a supportive staff. And so I feel like I, I have that behind me to not freak out too much. <laughs> and, um, and accountability. I mean, the, all of the decisions we make are group decisions mm -hmm. for the most part or have been group decisions. We've been without a general director for, you know, we've been without for like 10 months or something before we hired Mary Birnbaum, who's here in the back. Okay. Um, and you know, making that decision to hire Mary was a huge thing for us. It's a big decision, as you know, to bring in a new director. And, and while it was a group decision, we had a committee, a search committee, and the board voted on it, I still felt like I was accountable. And somehow you know, it, it was me who was going to get the credit to some extent mm -hmm. or the blame. And not just for that, but for other decisions that, that we've made over the last year which were the staff decisions and things, you know, this year we're at UPH for the first mm -hmm. time. So we have a lot of changes with the opera this year, particularly, but we have an incredibly engaged board now and the staff is wonderful. Um, we are one of the few arts organizations that has an all female staff and um, they've been great. I mean, really working together incredibly well. And so um, little shameless plug that the opera starts on Friday at UPH. Um, <laughs> We, if you put a raffle ticket in the little jar out there, you can, we'll do a drawing for two free tickets to Gentleman's Guide mm -hmm. to Love and Murder. Um, anyway, it's, it, it is a very different feeling being president and the level of, of accountability and visibility are really the things. Um, what do you think you've done best as the board president that you've brought to the organization because I'm going to tell you that one of my board members on our fundraising committee specifically said, ask them why their gala went so well. <laughs> uh, the reason it went so well is Katrina, who's sitting in the back, <laughs> as well as, I mean, we had a great gala committee. We really had yeah. a great gala committee. We did a lot of things a little differently this year. We came back to Saratoga. We'd been up north for mm -hmm. a few years, and I think coming back to Saratoga, being at National, um, you know, those made a big difference. But um, I think that the board, you know, I would say that for the first four or five years I was on the board, it felt people like were sort of disengaged. People weren't really actively involved in a lot. And I think I feel like we've really engaged people now. Even people who hadn't really been doing a whole lot for a while are back engaged and they're working on subcommittees. We're redoing our bylaws and we're doing, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I think our meetings are a little bit better. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a pain here. How did you make that happen? How do you engage the board? How do you take a disengaged board and turn it into an engaged board? That's a great question. In fact, I asked that same question when I went to the <laughs> Opera America conference. I said, you know, how, how can we? And, and the answer was very simple. Give them things to do mm -hmm. and ask people individually to take things on. And, you know, when I'm sitting with you and I say, will you read this document for me? It's a little hard to say no. <laughs> and um, you can't blow off my email or ignore and pretend you didn't see it. So I think by asking people individually to step up, mm -hmm. they mostly have. And it's not everyone, but, but really many more than have been in, in the past. And, and then it carries on to other things they do because then maybe they do something else or get involved in another committee or, or come to see a show that maybe they hadn't been to something or they hadn't been to the gala in a few years and this mm -hmm. year they came. So just bit by bit. And I think that the whole, you know, we, we've sort of re-energized the company. Having a new general director helps mm -hmm. with that too. So. Sure. Um, that, that is a good answer. And I would say that I've, I've seen that at play in our organization too here. Um, the board is just incredibly engaged at this point and it really makes a difference for the whole organization. The amount of risks that you could take, um, new projects you can take on, uh, just really changes. Yeah, that's great. Um, burr, 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 burr. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a really hard question. Um, so 
it seems to me like you have touched a lot of different things in your in your life and in your career, and now you're engaged in all of these different organizations um, that are all Saratoga themed, but you know, opera, books, uh, pride. What is the role of creativity and curiosity in what you do? Um, I'll start with curiosity because mm-hmm. that's much easier for me. Um, I love to learn. I've always loved to learn. So um, I could be a perpetual student if I could figure out a way to do it in my life. So um, taking on new things each time, uh, you know, doing Pride, doing the book festival, it's different every year. So, you know, each year with the book festival, we add something new. Last year, we added a marketplace for the first time. And this year, we'll do something else that we add on top of that. And so I get to learn so many things with each of the activities I'm involved in. Um, this year I've been helping with marketing for the opera, which is not something I had a lot of experience in, but, uh, I had a great mentor, this uh, woman, Michelle, who's been volunteering and helping us out and she's taught me a lot and I've been taking things on and it's a blast. I actually really kind of like marketing. Who knew? And, um, (laughs) and so it's, it's kind of, it's fun to learn. And and so curiosity plays a huge part for me. It keeps me energized and motivated and excited to learn. Um, And creativity, you know, I like to think I'm a problem solver and find creative ways to solve problems. Um, So I think that, you know, it's not just creative, creativity in terms of arts creativity, um, because I'm not an artist per se, but but I like to be creative in finding solutions to things. Yeah, just so. like sparky thinking, yeah. Um, I know that uh, a lot of people who wind up in leadership positions get a lot of energy from taking on new projects and uh, and rolling up their sleeves and learning, learning new skills and um, that that in and of itself, like the more you do, the more energized you get. But there can be kind of a tipping point there where <laughs> you end up with just too much on your plate and and you start to get kind of exhausted and feel like you're just on the hamster wheel. Do you ever have moments like that? And how do you deal with it? Has that ever happened, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, certainly Eric, um, my husband who's sitting here, um, is well aware of when, when I reach that limit, when mm-hmm. things sort of get to be too much and I start to feel a little bit overwhelmed. What does that look like for you? What is overwhelm? feel like or look like for you Eric what does it look like for <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's funny I the sometimes when I just have too much to do I can't do anything mm, and yeah. and so I become completely non-productive mm-hmm. and so um you know when I I can't figure out what to do next and so I just can't do anything and um usually I can sort of sort of recenter myself and I can make lists. I love to make lists. Mm -hmm. And so I will sort of sit down and say, okay, I just need to take off these three things and get them done. Um, you know, and, and, and put things in, in realize the, the priority and the order of importance that things need to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm one of those people who can sometimes go to what's easiest rather than what's most important. Or I'm very much like Pavlov's dog when my, email used to ding, I'd forget anything I was doing and I'd go, oh, look, email, I can do that <laughs> because it's something I could do quickly and sure. do, you know, and then feel this sense of like I got something done. Um, so I think if I, if I can focus myself and get time, um, you know, it was hard during COVID because I had a lot of things that I was doing, a lot of volunteer stuff I was doing, but somehow it was just hard to focus. And mm. I know everyone sort of felt that way at times, but, um, especially when things kept getting canceled or changing or, um, but you know, now it's a matter of fortunately the things I do are somewhat, um, part of year specific. So Mm -hmm. pride is June. Unfortunately, the opera and pride sort of come at the same time, which is a a tough thing, but the book festival is in October. So, you know, so I have cycles that I can sort of focus on things and I can get one thing out of the way before another one really takes over. So that's great. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, where are we time wise? Okay, we've just got about five minutes left, and so I just want to make sure that. Um, so, I'm not sure if you have anything more that you'd like to add along these lines, but one question that I really love, and I've gotten some great suggestions out of this, is just. Um, 
things that you do to get inspired again when your energy is flagging. Um, and, you know, people have talked about all different kinds of things, but is there any kind of like go-to practice or sort of well of inspiration in your life that um, feeds you? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything I can sort of put a finger on. I don't really meditate, although I've mm -hmm. tried a few times. I can't mm -hmm. focus enough to do that. Um, but, you know, I think just... I mean, I, I get re-inspired when I go see new shows or when mm -hmm. I listen to certain music or I get inspired about the things I'm doing. Um, you know, it used to be in my life, conferences were a great thing. Yeah. You know, when I would go to a conference and you just get such a bunch of energy and you get re-energized. And, you know, I remember when I was, um, you know, working in education and, and working in corporate world, going to a conference was one of those things that, and, and I would get that from other people. And, you know, even though I'm a behind the scenes guy, I'm, I'm really an extrovert, mm -hmm. um, sort of an introverted extrovert, whatever. So I get energy from people. So I definitely get energy being around people and working with people and, and friends and, and finding you know, support in that. So I can get re-energized when other people are energized about mm. something. So even if I'm feeling like a little like, oh, I don't really want to be here. When I'm around a committee and everybody's excited to be there and do it, then I immediately get that. So. Yeah. And, do you, and so, all right, and let me also ask you, um, when you find that you need some new skill or some new thing that you need to learn in order to be effective in a project, like you mentioned marketing, what are your go-to ways of kind of learning new skills? Um, I wish I could say I was a reader who, because I love books, but I'm not a reader of like nonfiction kind of how-to books or, mm -hmm. or those sort of things. Um, I'm much more a by example or, you know, figure it out kind of person. Um, I watch what other people do. I, I immediately pick up from how someone else is doing something. Like with the marketing, you know, I had a lot of conversations where it, things were explained to me and, and usually I can pick stuff up quickly in that way. And so... So um, you find somebody who knows how yeah, to do it and yeah, you find somebody who has special skills. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's what in the learning world they call kind of shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. learning because that's definitely my best you know, modeling after someone else who's been doing something. That proves um, you're an extrovert because as an introvert, I don't want anybody to know that I don't know. And so I find the book and I go in my corner and I read it and I come out the world's foremost authority. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, do you have a like a question in your mind or any advice that you would want to ask a room full of nonprofit leaders at this point? So I thought about this a little bit, and you know, we're all in the same boat. Like many of us, whether it's a human services organization or an arts organization, we're all competing for the same resources, mm -hmm. and we're all trying to get the same level of support and involvement and. And you know, one of the things that we struggle with is getting new board members mm -hmm. and how to, how to diversify, diversify a board in a community that doesn't really look diverse. And you know, what, what can we do to attract people to be engaged board members? And you know, it's something I wish, for example, the chamber would do something. You know, we've had a few sessions of, of really interesting topics with the nonprofit sector, but how to get board members and how to engage board members is one that I would really wonder how, you know, who's been really successful in that mm -hmm. and, and how and why. You know, diversity is a challenge, racial diversity is a challenge in this community that is largely white, largely white county. And when we fill out our grant applications, it's always a very important question that we have to answer. And, and um, none of us wants to be making excuses. We just want to do it. Right. Yeah. So there's your conversation starter for when we turn off the mics in a minute. <laughs> um, and uh, I also want to just ask you if there's anything else you want to say in conclusion. Well, I do want to point out um, my teal ribbon here is mm -hmm. because this is um, Scleroderma Awareness Month, and in addition to the three nonprofits that I'm doing stuff with, I also am working part time for the Stefan Scleroderma Foundation, which is a nonprofit supporting research and education around uh, scleroderma, which is a rare autoimmune disease mm -hmm. that's really very devastating. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and is show. the foundation in this area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an Albany based foundation started by. Um, What's Lee's Lee? Lee Shapiro. 
thank you. Mm. My head just went phew. Lee Shapiro, um, whose partner Patrick works here sometimes. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Um, we're going to have another conversation about this when the mics are off. Okay. Everybody, thank you very much for being here. Um, help yourself to coffee and cookies in the back if you would like. Uh, and we do this. Can I do my promotion bit? Yes, we can. And I'm also, I'll just, before I forget, we do this on the um, final Tuesday of each month, but we are not going to be doing it in July and August because Saratoga is just different then. So. All right. I have a few different commercial announcements. So first of all, I mentioned Opera Saratoga, which is beginning its festival season on Friday at UPH. And anyone watching online or anyone here can get discount tickets by using the code OSWELCOME, O-S-W-E-L-C-O-M-E. -E. You get a 15% discount on any tickets. And we actually, we're going to sort of raffle off a pair of tickets now if um, when we get off the mic, we can do that for people here. And then uh, secondly, the Saratoga Book Festival. Mark your calendars for October 13th through 15th. And everybody here gets a book festival bag. Ellen has bags there. And uh, Saratoga Pride has a couple events coming up. There's a women's music right here at Cafe Lina on Friday at noon. It's a, yeah, that's a vinyl record listening party. And Cindy and Joyce will be leading that, women's music <laughs> of the 70s and 80s. And then on July 13th, mark your calendars for a miniature golf night family event at the Windchill Factory in Boston Spa. Oh, there. That's the one for me. All right. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, everybody. <laughs>